So I have uh, uh, 1002, so I think we'll get started here in Nova Scotia, it's 1002. Um, my name is Carrie Foley. I'm the PD and Marketing Coordinator for the Nova Scotia Association and the Newfoundland and Labrador Association. I'd like to welcome you all here today um, for a very timely session. Um, we do have brokers from across Atlantic Canada that are on the call today, so thank you all for taking time out of your schedule uh, and joining us. Uh, I would like to introduce Dana Warren. Some of you have um, no doubt attended some of Dana's sessions before, and uh, you already know you're in for a very informative webinar. I'll give a little bio about Dana before we get started. So Dana Warren is based in St. John's, Newfoundland, and she's a certified life coach and counselor specializing in professional development and mental health. While her main focus is person-centered therapeutic practice with individuals, she also tailors customized seminars and workshops that address issues like communication, productivity, mental health and wellness, and mental health and wellness. Her empowering style stirs people and supports her reputation as a motivating force with a passion for being useful. As a therapist with the University of Waterloo, she delivered frontline clinical mental health programs and intervention services to a diverse international student body. Dana is an avid hiker, yogi, and dog owner who frequents the trails of the Avalon. Dana's practice DMW Coaching and Counseling was founded in 2011. So Dana, at this time, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks everyone for taking this hour out of your day. Uh, before we get started, I would really like to acknowledge what has happened in Nova Scotia over the past number of days. Um, I'm a past resident of Nova Scotia. I lived there for 10 years and my heart is aching. Um, it's been very upsetting. I've been very emotional over the last number of days and um, a song came to my mind that I just want to share with you to let you know that collectively we're holding you. And that's a song by Blue Rodeo. And there's a line that says, if we're lost, then we are lost together. So what are we going to do today? We're going to make sure that Dana can use her computer. <laughs> What are you going to get out of today? Um, I hope uh, education and awareness and tools to explore and understand how anxiety in these turbulent times uh, play a role in your life. What I hope that brings you is some insight so that you can gain a sense of power and control. So I invite you now to just take a moment to turn off your distractions and to land here with me. So I invite you to forget about what just happened, put aside what you might be going to do in an hour and just allow yourself, give yourself permission to spend the next hour with me. The impact of COVID-19. How many times have we heard those words of late? Everything has changed. Our priorities, our daily routines, and our ability to connect. A heightened fear of anxiety is real, and everyone is feeling these feelings. It's a shared experience. And to feel a heightened fear of anxiety right now is expected, and it's understandable, in fact, I would say if you didn't feel that, that would be outside of the norm. Your caveman brain is on bust. And I'm going to go into a little bit more about our caveman brain through this presentation. Social disconnection from relationships. While I think we're all adapting to that, we still have been tasked with the idea of creating and maintaining distance but we are actually meant to be connected. It is a fundamental feature of survival. Isolation is now the new norm. Staying in your bubble is the new norm. 
And that expectation that we all do it is, is very real. And I would say many of us have adapted to that, but I think we come in and out of how we feel about it. The threat of the unknown, it's a very real present day threat. And our response is to be on constant alert, even if you don't know it. And stress and change is actually exhausting. It's a very unique time. Um, the only comparable time that I have seen people come up with is the Spanish flu, 1918. My partner is personally obsessed with the Spanish flu right now, with the timelines, the statistics, the recovery. And part of that is him trying to make sense of what's happening right now. Totally understandable. So all of these things are normal human responses to the reality of the world situation. And these responses come in waves. Sometimes they're more intense than others. Like today, the sun is out in Newfoundland where I'm sitting. You might wake up and have the most normal day of all, get all the things that you wanted to get done, done. But maybe this afternoon, you sort of, you get hit with a wave and you're exhausted and you don't feel like doing anything. And that's the intensity of this heightened awareness of what's happening. So understanding and respecting the cues of our bodies and our minds will help us adapt as we're meant to do. So here's a little video that helps us explain this adaptability today. The human mind has evolved to think in such a way that it naturally creates psychological suffering. You see, back in the Stone Age, 200,000 years ago, life was pretty dangerous for our caveman ancestors. So if a caveman or cavewoman wanted to survive, their minds had to constantly be on the lookout for things that might hurt or harm them. And if that cave person's mind wasn't good at predicting, spotting, or avoiding danger, what happened to her? The default setting of the caveman mind was safety first. And we in the modern world have inherited this. Our modern minds are constantly warning us of things that might hurt or harm us. The caveman mind says, watch out, there might be a bear in that cave, it could get eaten. Watch out, that shadow on the horizon might be an enemy from another clan, you could get speared. Our modern mind then does worrying, predicting the worst, avoiding anything that scares you, anxiety in all of its different forms. Back in caveman days, you survive an encounter with a bear or a wolf, then it's useful to replay it. It's useful for your mind to go over the events and remember what you did to survive so that you're better prepared for next time. But in our modern world, we go over and over painful memories, dwelling on them, reliving them, even when there's nothing useful to learn or the lesson has been well and truly learned a long time ago. In the Stone Age era, as a caveman or cavewoman, you have to fit in with the group. If you are alone, you will soon die. So your mind compares you to others in the group. Am I fitting in? Am I contributing enough? Am I following the rules? Am I doing anything that might get me thrown out? Now, in modern life, we're always comparing ourselves to others. But the problem is we're no longer in a small group. Our groups are enormous today, and we carry with us devices that constantly feed us images and stories of people all over the planet. This constant comparison ramps up our fear of being judged or rejected or not fitting in or just not being good enough. The caveman mind tells you, you need more food, you need more water, better weapons, better shelter. The cave people who thought this way lived longer and had more offspring. Unfortunately, in the modern world, this manifests as greed, dissatisfaction, craving, wanting, it's never enough, I need more, more, more. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, these Stone Age thought patterns are intensified by the sheer pace and complexity of modern life. Our frantic existence, rushing from task to task, that never-ending to-do list. So 
when your mind starts doing this unhelpful stuff as all minds do remember it's not defective or abnormal and it's not deliberately trying to make your life difficult it's simply doing the job it has evolved to do trying to keep you safe and save you from pain the human here we go i love that video because it lets me know that the way my brain works is is actually has meaning it has reason but it still brings anxiety into the game so let's talk for a moment about the context of our unique lives as we're coming into this time right we have different levels of challenges some of us might be co-parenting at a distance some of us might be single parents who are managing out alone some of us might be on our own uh, we may be caring for family you might have space at home for yourself you might have none you might have to travel further for the basics you might have physical challenges you might be financially uncertain feeling insecure i read some research today yesterday that told me that one in three people spend an hour of day worrying thinking about economic insecurity we might have histories of difficulty and stress the impact of preconditions are big here so we might already have anxiety or depression or trauma or past events in our lives that impact us when things like this come up and when we're trying to cope in a stressful world we might be prone to defensiveness or reactivity so know that about yourself and a key ingredient to managing all of this is awareness so we're talking today about awareness as understanding so insight and that can be very empowering and it can help us influence our responses to what's happening it gives us permission it can allow ourselves to go oh hey i'm feeling anxious this is a sig signal to me that i need to do something or do nothing we have to create distance and maintain distance but we're meant to be in connection so that's a truly weird conundrum the idea of staying away from each other actually heightens anxiety in us i'm an introvert i'm even missing people <laughs> and then there's the opposite we're actually nervous and suspicious of others so it bears repeating that this actually makes a lot of sense every one of us has a spidey sense and when we're stressed when we're feeling anything at all actually we pick up on the feelings from other people in our lives so that includes our pets the dog knows exactly how i feel <laughs> uh, our children are very very sensitive to our feelings as we are sensitive to theirs and i'd like to particularly mention our clients we pick up on their stresses for sure and we're not made of teflon A threat response actually evokes fear and it's meant to evoke fear. Do you know why? So that we do something so that we remove it. Fear is trying to protect us. We're impacted on a physical level. So we might find more tension in our bodies. We brace ourselves, headaches, pain. On an emotional level, we might be flooded with feelings of helplessness or sadness or fear, frustration, anger, and overwhelm. Mentally, our thoughts are very busy or scattered, or we can't remember anything, or we get caught in loops of worry, worst case scenarios, that's my biggie. We might be avoiding things or using escapism inside of our thoughts. And then spiritually, this threatens our overall sense of security meaning and purpose has shifted and this is very disorienting so the day-to-day -day is different and this impacts our identity who am i now in face of all of this who are my fellow human beings how do we get through this what's important to me what matters if you find yourself thinking these things it totally makes sense and give yourself permission to go there 
So how do we react to the unknown? Well, we're meaning making machines who want to understand and know what is going to happen. So it's very natural to want information, take control, and sometimes avoid it all. We have access to information 24 seven, and it's a great resource, but it can throw us off and throw us out of balance. Just like a craving, it can feel like a strong urge to fix or find answers. Certainly in the beginning, I was face and eyes into information. From the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed and then slept fitfully. It's very natural to crave control, to want to be able to fix what's happening because we want to remove that threat. And not knowing can make us feel helpless and powerless. And that's a really, really uncomfortable feeling when we crave security. So we might find ourselves more on edge, grumpier, critical of our partners, of our friends, of our neighbors. You know, how many people here have wondered out loud, why is that person at the grocery store picking up the oranges and laying them down again? Or can't they see that I'm on this sidewalk too? Can they cross the street? That's the one that gets to me, is when people get too close to me. Or you might find yourself finding that everything is a constant reminder of the pandemic and that evokes stress and anxiety. Um, so you avoid things and it can look like denial, like maybe you have people in your life or who, who you would call in denial or think that they don't care, but we're really in protection mode when we're there. So what's the challenge here? Balance. Controlling what comes in, how we access information, and understanding what's in and out of our control helps us temper the threat of the unknown. Let's talk a bit for about anxiety. A, a, a bit about anxiety. So, anxiety is natural. Uh, healthy anxiety can motivate us. It can help us ward off dangers, make us aware of the negative things that we might want to change. But the unhealthy stuff is not so good. It can convince us that we should be afraid, that we should think a certain way, and generally hold us back from doing things that anxiety considers dangerous. At its worst, it can prevent us from enjoying everyday activities and relationships. It can cause us to perform poorly, preoccupy us wastefully, you know those thoughts, and stop our creativity and our productivity. But without anxiety, we wouldn't survive for the many reasons we've already talked about. So it's helpful then to recognize it when it shows up, observe it, get to know it, so that we can shift our relationship to it and see it as a signal. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling extra stressed. What do I need to do right now? Or what do I need to not do? And then we can learn how to ride the wave. We start inviting people. Imagine one day you decide to throw a party for all your friends. You get out your phone and you start inviting people. You want a really big party, so you say, anyone can come. And on the big day, you get your place ready for the party. And you're really excited to see everyone. Pretty soon, the guests all start arriving. After a while, everyone you're expecting has arrived and you're having a really good time. But then the doorbell goes. You think, I wonder who that is. It must be someone I've forgotten about. And it is someone who you definitely did not want at the party. It's your neighbor, Brian. Brian has to be one of the most annoying people you know. He's rude, grumpy, he moans a lot, and he's not so flash on personal hygiene. He's the last person you want at your party. But before you know it, he goes straight inside without even saying hello. And he goes up to your guests and he's rude. He helps himself to drinks and food. And he generally 
acts a little weird towards your friends. And understandably, you feel pretty upset, embarrassed and angry. And before long, you over to Brian and tell him, that's it, it's time for you to go. And you throw him out of your party. Once he's gone, you feel relieved. You go back to the party and start to enjoy yourself. But after a while, you hear the doorbell again. And when you go to check who it is, you realize Brian has come back. And before you can stop him, he opens the door and races back into the party. So you go out and get him and throw him out again. This time though, you decide you're going to make sure he doesn't come back. So you decide to stand by the door and make sure he can't get back in. And this works fine. Brian can't get back in and you feel good about this. Trouble is, you realize that all the while you're missing out on the party. You can hear everyone else outside having a good time. You want to be out at the party too. But because you can't stand Brian, you can't risk him coming back in again. And you don't know what to do. You really want to enjoy the party, but the thought of Brian being there really gets to you. After a while, you realize that actually this party is pretty important to you and you want to be with your friends in the very least just to make sure they're okay. So you decide to go back out and you say to yourself, if Brian comes out, that's how it goes. And sure enough, after a couple of minutes, Brian comes back in and starts being annoying again. But this time something's different. You don't ignore him because he's pretty hard to ignore, but you decide just to get on with the party and talk with your friends. And you start to notice some interesting things. First, you find that even though Brian is still there, you're actually having an okay time. Sure, it'd be better if he went home, but at least you're not stuck at the door, missing out on the party. Second, you notice that when you're not trying to get rid of him all the time, he calms down a little bit. He's still a pain, he still smells, but he's not so rowdy. And then after that, you start to notice some other things about Brian you hadn't actually seen before. Like that he has a quirky sense of humor, even though it's buried pretty deep. And he even makes a couple of friends of yours laugh. And you wonder to yourself, what do you do next time you have a party? I love that video because our mind works in metaphors, right? And we want to be able to figure out how we can live with anxiety as best that we can. And the thing is, is that our response to anxiety is actually changeable and adaptable. And with simple awareness and good practices, we can actually use it to our advantage and build our psychological muscle with it. And one of the main ingredients to building that psychological muscle is the realization of our own resilience. Life doesn't get easier or more forgiving. We actually get stronger and more resilient because we're built to survive. Look at that tree <laughs> surviving it all in that body of water. We adapt so very quickly. Hence, the new norm is the catchphrase of our day. Now being resilient doesn't mean that we don't feel sad or we don't get angry or upset or frustrated. It simply means we find a way to deal with it. And our strengths and creativity come to the forefront at times of stress. If resilience was a pot of soup, creativity would be a main ingredient. I've never seen so many creative responses to what's happening out there, be it uh, beautiful masks, I never knew that most people in my life could sew. Uh, the way that people are engaging in conversations, uh, contactless service delivery, like to be able to actually have food that nourishes you, that you love come to your door, or you are able to get it, it's brilliant. Uh, I've seen family jams, comedy hours, games nights, uh, cocktail hour via Zoom, pot banging to say thank you for those essential workers who are out there. The candle lighting just a couple of nights ago across Nova Scotia and here in my life, singing and the list goes on. 
The other ingredient in that pot of soup would be vulnerability. And when we lean into our vulnerability, and that really means just feeling our feelings and expressing them and letting them be there, we become stronger for it. Because as Brene Brown says, you can't get the courage without walking through vulnerability. So we need to be open. We need to feel what is happening to us. Like a storm, this too shall pass. We become collectively stronger from adapting. Remember the old adage, what doesn't kill us will make us stronger? I'm sorry to be so on the button, but it's never been more true than today. And our resilience will grow during this. So how, how do we do this? Well, we shift our focus and start to consider what is possible. Remember, we have choice and we do control some things in our lives. And that really leads me to our first little exercise that I'd like to invite you guys to do with me. So if, if you're sitting at your desk and you have a pad, a piece of paper and a pen, then I invite you to use it. And if you don't, I just invite you to um, engage in this little exercise in your head. I'd like to return for a moment to the idea of the natural desire to control what's happening and then further explore this idea of choice. So on that pad of paper or in your head, I want you to consider what in the present day and what is happening is actually outside of your control. And I'm gonna give you a minute to do that. Okay, so I obviously did this exercise because I want to go through some of the things that we can identify. So here's what I came up with. Uh, the timeline. I can't control when this is going to end. And that has been my biggest obsession. Me wanting to feel secure, so I want to know when it's going to be over. Or when businesses are going to open up. Or when life's going to get back to normal. The other thing I can't control is people's behaviors and responses. Uh, in the beginning of this pandemic, our health minister, uh, Haggy, he kept talking about people looking for loopholes. And I think I might've been one of those people in the beginning. I was looking for ways around the rules. But I quickly came to understand that I can control what I'm up to and my behaviors and responses matter. I also can't control the outcomes. So numbers wise, I can't control how many people get sick. I can't control recovery. I can't control how many new cases there are a day or how many um, cases there aren't. I can't control how the outcomes are, just, are going to impact this timeline. The other one I can't control is the economy. I am particularly worried about what is going to happen. And sometimes I allow myself a few minutes to worry, but I realize I can't control it in the big picture. And another large one is media messaging. I can't control what's being said out there, which leads me to considering now this next part of the exercise. I want you to take a moment to write down what's in your control.
Okay, here's what I came up with. What is in my control? My behaviors, my responses. So what I get up to, what I say and what I do, I can control my work, um, how I work, when I work. Uh, I can control my routine, how I take care of myself, how I take care of other people. Um, I can control my boundaries. So that means I can control who I listen to and who I don't listen to, what media sources I use. Uh, if I say yes to things or no to things, where I go, when I go. And I can control, you know, my basic needs, food, uh, water, sleep. I'll get into those a little bit more later on as well. So this still begs the question, if you are holding all of that in your hand, those things that you can control, just imagine that, that you were holding all those bits in your hand. Do you think that's enough? And now I want you to think back to what we can't control, what's outside of our control. If you were to pile all of that into your hand, what do you think might happen? Yeah, it would fall through your fingers because it's too much to carry. So the question is, how do we let go of what we can't control? Well, with awareness and acceptance. It is what it is. Some of you may be familiar with this video because it is my all time favorite. Um, this video explores the idea of acceptance and awareness. And these are skills that make up the practice of mindfulness. And there's a difference between mindfulness and meditation. Mindfulness is more than sitting cross-legged at a river. It's actually how we notice our thinking, our feelings, and our actions without judgment, which is the challenging part. Mindfulness encourages kindness and compassion towards ourselves and others. And this makes us better at meeting these challenges during these turbulent times. There's a story usually attributed to the Native American tradition, which illuminates different ways of paying attention. An elder talking to a child says, I have two wolves fighting in my heart. One wolf is fearful, vengeful, envious, resentful, and deceitful. The other wolf is compassionate, loving, generous, truthful, and peaceful. The child asks, which wolf will win the fight? The elder responds, the one I feed. That doesn't mean we try to deny or hurt or kill the angry wolf. If we did that, we'd end up in a long battle, all the while somehow making that wolf more powerful through our hostility and fear. Hating that wolf sucks the strength right out of us. Instead, we calmly pay attention to the angry wolf and let go of believing they have the answers. If we can do that, they end up lying down next to us, no longer an enemy. We help strengthen the kind and loving wolf, giving it nourishment and support so that we can follow it. That peaceful wolf can become our steady companion and show us the way through all kinds of different life experiences, restful or chaotic, enjoyable or disappointing experiences may come and go, but we can have a guide with us through it all. This is what mindfulness can help you do. Mindfulness allows us to see our thoughts and feelings as they are beginning. It's very powerful to know what we're feeling as we're feeling it, know what we're thinking as we're thinking it. With mindfulness, we can choose what will strengthen and bring into action, and we can choose what we will gently let go of. We don't have to be at the mercy of old habits or old ways of thinking or old ways of being. We are empowered. It just takes practice. The thing about that video is when we think about a good wolf and a bad wolf, we have both. 
But how we respond to fear and anxiety, how we notice what it's up to, can really, really make a difference to how prepared we are for what's happening to us. So I'd like to take the next 15 minutes of our presentation just to offer you some tools for these turbulent times. Um, I'm going to share ways of working with anxiety and fear, considering the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual context. Uh, so that, this means that I'm going to ask you to get brave and I'm going to invite you to try some of these things with me. The stressed body is a braced and defensive body. You might be finding physically that you're holding your breath. Uh, you might be more achy and experiencing muscle tension, headaches, stomach aches. Stomach aches is, is specifically something that kids talk a lot about, having tummy aches or pains. You might have random pain. You might have old injuries acting up. It's important to consider your activities of daily living. There's really never a better time for routine than when the world outside is out of our control. But you need to manage your expectations around this. And I'm gonna tell you a little story. So. I am a counselor, uh, that's what I do full time, and I have a client who is co-parenting and they have three children. Her partner, her ex-partner works abroad, he came home, he had to quarantine for two weeks, and then it was finally the day that she was going to have a weekend. So the kids were going to go and spend the weekend with um, their dad. She had a gigantic list of things to do. She couldn't wait to get to all of the millions of things that she had to do that she couldn't do with the kids in the house. And she found herself during that weekend completely exhausted. She had nothing in her. She barely managed to press play on movies. And I spoke to her on that Monday, our session was a Monday, and she spent most of the session beating herself up. How come I couldn't do it? What's wrong with me? Why? So judgment was big. The other thing that happened was comparing. You know, everybody else seems to be getting so much done and everybody's doing yoga and everybody's getting all the tasks done on their list and they're having four walks and making cakes. We need to give ourselves permission to manage our own expectations and to do our best to not play the comparison game. Secondly, I invite you to pay attention and take care of the basics. And the basics are food, of course, water, and rest. And while I call them basic, they're really essential in your care. In the beginning of all of this, I counted my days successful if I ate, if I drank a glass of water, and got to bed at a reasonable hour, and got up, you know, at a reasonable hour as well. Um, maybe you're adapting now better, but really manage your expectations around what you can get to do, but do not forget the basics. And now I'm going to take you through a few practices that you can use on a daily basis to help encourage you to settle. Help encourage you physically to settle and emotionally to settle. Because when we attend to the body, we're also looking after our mind. So it's a really good place to start in that physical space. So these activities, the first two are interactive in that I, I'm going to invite you to participate. And the next one is a concept. So I'd like for you to notice where you're seated. Just settle into your chair. And hold something, like pick up something that's around you in your hand. Maybe it's a cup or in my hand, I have a little egg that is my lip balm, or you have a pen. Whatever is within hand's reach, just pick it up. And I just, I'm inviting you to notice it. Is it solid or smooth or is it warm? Can you cradle it? Is it heavy or light? What color is it? And now I invite you to gently close your eyes and just find your center. Your feet are on the ground, close to what's happening. Just 
feel your breath there. I invite you to rock gently, sort of in a rhythm that kind of feels natural to you. Do you ever see your kids rocking gently back and forth? It's comfort. Feel your breath there in your body. Feel that support under you, your solid foundation. Sense the ground beneath you, the earth, it's down there. Connect to your solid foundation, imagining the earth beneath you and feel your breath and the pulse of you right down to your toes. And just take a moment feeling that support. And when you're ready, you can gently come back, open your eyes. This is a really simple exercise that cues your body and mind to just settle for a few moments. It takes you out of your head. It can take you there very quickly. You can do it just by holding an object and getting curious. Some people aren't comfortable closing their eyes and I totally get that. But if you pick something up that is yours and you get curious about it, it can bring you to that sense of settling. And that's what we're after. It's a cue to your body and your mind to just settle for a few moments. And you can do it anywhere and almost any time. And it's really great for taking us out of our head and moving us into the body. Uh, this next exercise uh, is a breathing piece. And that's another thing that some people can have trouble with. But this is a great one to do with kids, actually. Children love this exercise. Um, and it's called blowing bubbles. So again, I'm gonna invite you to get out of your comfort zone and blow a few bubbles with me. I'm assuming many of you might already have a few ways of getting into your breath as a way of calming your physical response to anxiety. Lots of people know about belly breathing and other kinds of breathing. But this little exercise is another tool. So let's take a moment to notice your breath, right? Then your breath stops all of a sudden when you invite it to be noticed. But just notice your breath and be curious about it, just like you were about that object in your hand. So is it in your nose or in your chest? Can you feel the sensation of the air? Just try squeezing your shoulders up to your ears in a big in-breath and then letting them drop with an out breath. Just find your breath. Do you have it? Okay, now I'm gonna invite you to draw in a great big breath and blow it out as if you're blowing up a bubble. So I'm gonna do this with you and we'll do it for two or three breaths only. So nice big inhale and Slow bubble out. Another big inhale and blow that bubble big. And let's do one more. And this exercise is actually a great way to explore your breath and it actually works um, physiologically. So you're lengthening and deepening your breath which actually sends a signal to your brain that you're okay. Because when we're in danger and we're in that constant scanning space and we have that tension going on in our body and we're shallow breathing, your brain is saying, figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. But if you tell your brain, oh, everything is fine, part of what's happening is the oxygen sends that message to your brain. Um, this is a great exercise to do, like make bubbles, do with your kids. Because that also brings you that presence of being just in what's happening with them. I think doing this a couple of times a day, like blowing four or five bubbles, is actually maintenance. So consider how you can blow bubbles. How's that for fun? Uh, the final sort of thing that I want you to think about is movement, um, stretching, rhythm in the body. Um, this is not an activity now. This is just you. I want you to take a moment to consider you. So take, a, take, a, take this minute now to intentionally reflect on how you're doing. How are you? Are you physically tired? What is your like quick assessment of yourself? 
what do you like to do? Um, you know, can you take a few minutes a day to simply stretch? Just to take your body through a few range of motion, whether that be stretching or just breathing, you know, stretching is not meant to be exercise. And if we're holding tension in our bodies, it's really a lot of work on your system. And stressing really allows you to really quickly reset and release. Um, many clients that I work with also swear by a physical regimen. So when we tap into the natural sort of rhythm of our body, like walking is, running, stretching, dancing, music really enhances each one of these and it takes the mind off things as well. So just figure out what is your movement, what is your thing, what can you do to physically tap in self? And whatever makes sense to you is relative to your unique circumstances. Um, you know, we talked a bunch about comparing. If you have a friend who's taken three walks and posting it on Facebook, you know, good for your friend. But if your version of that is to take 10 minutes at lunchtime and go out on the back deck, and have a little stretch, that's okay too. Do what works for you and give yourself permission to do that. Allow yourself to do what works for you and try to stay out of the comparison game. And I know a lot of uh, parents who I work with talk about having responsibilities to work and family. And I don't let that take away your much needed attention to your body. 10 minutes is 10 minutes. Managing thoughts. Do you know your brain produces on average 10,000 thoughts a day? Yep. If it had a job description, this would be the major duty. But don't believe everything your mind thinks. Thoughts are really just thoughts. They're information that you can take or leave. And when we actually take a second to just hit the pause button and take a breath and say, hang on now, what's my mind telling me? We can actually be discerning and we can make better choices about their messaging. And it also allows you to like pay attention to the story that your mind is telling you, because there's a story. We're meaning making machines, right? The mind can get carried away and often its favorite place to go is what if. Um, and by just creating some space between you and your thoughts, you can do a reality trek and slow things down. So I'd like to run through um, a thought process and some questions or reality checks that you can use. Well, the thought that comes to me often is, we, you know, we often just need a nudge to bring a more balanced way of thinking into play. One of the big things that comes to me is, what if I catch COVID? Or what if I am a carrier? Or what if I die or someone I love dies? Um, and maybe, you know, you've moved beyond that, but it's still very much a part of me when I go out. So the first thing we, we can do is notice the thought and name the thought. Oh, that's worry. And then I can ask myself, right now, is this thought actually true? Well, the truth is I could catch COVID. I might die if I contracted the disease, but many, many people recovery are in recovery and have recovered. And um, there are vulnerable populations, but even vulnerable populations, there's recovery. So what steps can I take to consider this thought? Well, that thought is trying to tell me, you better take care of yourself. You better figure this out. So I'm following the rules. I'm staying inside my bubble. I'm washing my hands. I'm taking precautions. I'm getting good information. Maybe I go out with a mask every time I go out. And I ask myself, what's in my control? Well, I can, can't control what other people do, but maybe if I do go out, I can wear a mask. I've started doing that. And while I felt pretty silly in the beginning, I just tell my other thought, like, you look silly, to just like pipe down. I'm just keeping us safe. And then I can ask myself, can I reframe this thought in any way? So instead of the what ifs, how about if I think about, if something happens, then I can respond. And that's where we can actually give our minds a job to do and it can get prepared, right? 
So how can we limit and manage our thoughts? We can limit news exposure. We can choose the sources of which we find out information. Uh, I have um, a couple of people in my life who are, are, their favorite story to tell me is the worst case scenario and all of the bad things that happen. And I have just decided that I can only have those kinds of conversation when I choose to, back to what I can control. You can also choose the time to take in information or browse social media. This is a tough one because we often want to get distracted and a great way to be distracted is browsing social media. So you really gotta catch yourself here. And the most important thing about all of this is reminding you that you have choice and control. And so a better way to spend your time thinking is what can I do to cope or handle what might happen? And when you got that figured out, you can put it on paper. Sometimes that's very useful. I actually have a bunch of coping statements that I, that I tell myself. And I think it's important to try to come up with statements that remind you of how you can cope with a particular situation. Like this, like I say to myself, if I, can, if I get anxious, I'll try to do some bubble breathing or I'll get out for a walk. I just need to do my best and practice what I know works washing my hands, <laughs> um, I remind myself that things will change. They've changed every day and they'll continue changing for the rest of my days. And I know how to handle stress. Like my stress, I can get up and get a glass of water, I can take a break. Um, there's some techniques that I use, like I might put my timer on to work for 20 minutes and then get up for five minutes and walk around. And when all else fails, I know my anxiety won't last forever. And having these statements around that are sort of preconceived can really help you when you're in the moment of stress or you have no more patience with your children. You know that old adage, count to 10 and walk away, really works. Stress, fear, and anxiety are normal responses to what's happening. But no one can keep up with these feelings 24 seven. So give yourself permission to not know, to not have it all figured out. And I want you to tap into the antidotes of fear and anxiety. And they are curiosity, creativity, joy, because it really helps you counter and buffer the impact. So what have you been doing in your own life? What would you like to do, but maybe feel a little bit silly about? I'm telling you, I'm inviting you, get silly, it's okay. Crafts, cooking, art, writing, playing cards, board games, making cookies, making cakes. Oh my God, I'm not a baker. Uh, puzzling, singing, dancing, silly games. These are all really, really wonderful and healing experiences. And they take your mind off things and they give you that much deserved break. Can I tell you right now that all of that is, an, is as important a job as your job? As many, many folks are saying, we are not working from home. We are working from home during a pandemic. Humor and play have a direct calming effect on our nervous system. So physiologically, humor and play calms us. Humor dissolves tension. I have clients that have anxiety and they use funny videos to take it away in an instant. And they don't go on Facebook searching for funny videos. They have them queued up on YouTube. So how can you invite humor into your life? How can you tap into what brings you joy? And don't feel guilty. It's bringing balance to your life and it'll help you and your loved ones get through this. Finally, I wanna talk about connection. Humans thrive in connection to each other and to themselves. It's why when we have good supports or feeling stressed out, people say, reach out. Connecting is our way of feeling the power of the planet, of collectivity. It helps us feel secure and a part of a bigger picture. Connection helps us make sense of it all because we're all in this together. If we're lost, we're lost together. I cannot overemphasize the difference between physical distance and social distance. And we have to be adaptive and come up with ways of connecting. And if social media is any indication, we're doing all right. People have figured this out. 
but let's not forget the essentialness of connecting to ourselves. My number one way to connect spiritually is to nature. My daily walk is good for my mental health. And there are days, especially with the overriding fears of the last few days, that my mind tells me not to go out. But I've never regretted a walk. I'm also keeping an eye on the crocuses, and the daffodils and tulips, and the greenery that's starting to poke its nose out of snowbanks where I'm living. <laughs> These are all signs of a new beginning which feeds directly into my feelings of hope and possibility. And waving at the odd human actually reminds me we're all in this together. And I'm thankful for the little things. And where I cultivate this gratitude is often in that walk with myself. So ask yourself, what helps you stay grounded and connected? You know, accomplishing things can be soothing as well, but also doing nothing is sometimes just about simply being and processing all of this. Um, I work with a client who told me she works with the federal government, policy changes 35 times a day. It's okay to process what's happening. Don't underestimate the healing power of doing nothing. And being curious helps us make meaning out of all of this. So I'd like to leave you with these questions. What are you learning to do that you never thought you would? What do you notice you are appreciating about the people around you? What are you appreciating about yourself? What are you grateful for even during all of this stress? What strengths and skills are you drawing upon? And what are you discovering about your own resilience? You know, the future holds possibilities for happiness and celebration as it always has. So focus on choice and control, the stuff that you have in the now, and you can leverage the power for your future selves. Thank you so much for having me once again. I hope this was useful. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dana, and uh, for everyone for joining us. I hope you all have a great uh, afternoon and take care.